And here we are for our final uh, lesson, lecture, whatever you would like to call it, for chapter 11. And we are well into the material to begin the second exam. So uh, the first exam is probably behind us at this point, and we are uh, about a third of the way through the semester. So hopefully things are going well for you. Um, so a few final things. So the, the major concepts and mathematical equations are vapor pressure uh, lowering, boiling point elevation, and freezing point depression. Being able to do the math and then explain why. Why in a solution do we see those three effects on those three properties or those effects on those three properties. So there's, um, we just kind of in teaching chemistry 122, we often toss in a couple of additional considerations. Um, really only one of them is something we spend a lot of time on. And that is, what if you have a solution that has more than one volatile component? So not glucose in water, but methanol and ethanol, both of which evaporate. What, what What's going on there? Okay, well, there's a little bit more we'll have to think about with that. So we will consider the vapor pressure of two or more volatile components, which are easily evaporated. I might as well toss this out here. Um, the acronym VOC is often used in science, usually not in a good way, for volatile organic compounds. So it's organic compounds, primarily carbon-based, uh, that are that turn into gases. Oftentimes those are not very safe because you don't want to be breathing them in, or they might be combustible. And if they're volatile, they're gaseous, that means they, they catch fire uh, quite quickly. So that's an equation we're going to consider. We're also going to consider something called osmotic pressure. This is more important in biology and exercise science uh, because you talk about the pressure differences across a membrane. It's sure it's important in all in all of uh, chemistry and engineering and sciences in general. And I have a little schematic over here. You may have heard uh, of something called reverse osmosis that's used to purify water. It's very effective at doing that. So this is just a little diagram here where uh, if you have pure water and you have glucose solution, you have this, uh, whoops, let me get a better color. You have this membrane here uh, that what you'll get is the pressure will actually build up uh, because of the concentration difference in the semi-permeable membrane and that's called osmotic pressure basically what will, what will happen and you can read about this in, in your uh, uh, book or even google it and see if you can find an animation about this is that you will get a lot of water this, this diagram kind of shows this water will go through the semi-permeable membrane, or actually go through both directions, but because there's glucose and glucose cannot go through the semi-permeable, therefore it's semi-permeable, not completely permeable membrane, and actually push the level of the water that starts off, so it's pure water here, glucose solution here, will actually push the level of the water up this tube, and that's called osmotic pressure. Now, this is the same kind of phenomenon that will happen in cells with, I think it's called passive membrane transport or something like that. Active membrane transport is like uh, sodium and lithium channels through that picture of the cell membrane we showed you before. Um, so that's called osmotic pressure. And it's the symbol for that, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's a like capital pi, it's like a really big pi. <laughs> uh, and then, um, yeah, and then external pressure, which is always there. But that's osmotic pressure, just a little schematic diagram of that. And briefly, well, we assume that in uh, solutions like sodium chloride, when they dissolve, it splits up into two species, the Van Hoff factor of two. Well, what happens when you start packing in high concentration solutions and this, the ions actually start interacting with themselves? So you don't necessarily get just two species with sodium chloride. And those are called non-ideal solutions. Probably not going to, I'm just going to mention this probably for interest. I don't think I'll do much more with them. If I do, I'll do it in class. Okay, so let's go through a little bit of math for osmotic pressure and vapor pressure when you have more than one volatile component. So 
There's, whoops, keep forgetting of that. So what do I mean by this? This means we're doing solutions, so homogeneous, where there is more than one volatile component. This is not like oil and water, but this is like methanol and uh, ethanol, so solution number three. And here's the equation. It, it, it built, builds on something you've heard before. Remember Dalton's law <coughs> of partial pressure? Excuse me, I just sneezed. I've been doing that a lot on these videos, coughing, sneezing, and losing my voice. The Dalton's law of partial pressure says the total pressure of a system is the sum of the individual components. So it doesn't really matter how many, and that's called Dalton's law of partial pressures or just partial pressures. Basically what we do is we take this and it's, and it's the extension of a calculation you've already done. The vapor pressure. So now we're switching over from just straight up gas pressure to vapor pressure of a solution. So it's the same thing it means it meant before. So P-vape of solution is the sum. Well, let's let's just do some traditional math from the sum. Oh, uh, <laughs> I does not mean Van Hoff factor here, by the way. I is just a counter. So we go from from the first to the nth component. So don't, don't worry about what this I means. So it's a sum of I equals one. So it's basically however many components you have. You add up the sums of the mole fractions times the vapor pressures of the solvents. So what does that mean? That means you take the mole fraction of one sol of one component times the vapor pressure of the pure component plus the next mole fraction times its pure vapor pressure. But this is only for volatile compounds. So the example I'm going to show you is for solution number three, where we have two okay, components. It doesn't really matter. So this is a uh, solution number three from way back. So the way we're going to set this up is that the vapor pressure of the uh, solution, whoa, that looks terrible, is going to be equal, since it's two components, it's going to be the uh, mole fraction of methanol, okay, times the vapor pressure of pure that's what the superscript zero means, not zero degrees Celsius, but pure or standard state. A pure methanol plus the mole fraction of, well, ethanol times the vapor pressure of pure. Well, yeah, you guessed it. And if we had 20 components, we would just do this 20 times. That's busy work. And I would have to give you some information. I don't know if we did the mole fractions. You know what? I'm going to skip that part and let you calculate the mole fraction. I'll give you the answers. And last year, <laughs> kind of like last lecture, we may have had some problems with this. I think I have the right answers now. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm good now. All right, so you'd have to be given the vapor pressures of the pure ones here. So let's see, uh, pure methanol, you can always look this up. What's the vapor pressure of pure methanol at 25 degrees Celsius or whatever temperature I give you? Pretty sure it's 127 millimeters of mercury. And the vapor pressure of pure ethanol is 59 millimeters of mercury. I know. Oh, that, that, that hand, those handwritten data I gave you a long time ago for intermolecular forces, I'm pretty sure I gave you uh, ethanol and methanol. So they both have dipole-dipole interactions, but methanol is a bigger molecule, therefore it has a lower vapor pressure than uh, methanol. That's a good one to go back and do. Now the mole fractions, again, I'm streamlining this here. We can certainly do this in class. Uh, oh yeah, this is actually challenging. I'm just going to describe how you would do this. In the problem, so we'll fill in this gap in class. In the problem, I give you volumes. There's 1.50 milliliters of methanol, and there's 48.50 milliliters of ethanol. I also give you the densities. So you could take the densities, 
convert the volumes into masses, and then convert each of those into moles and get your mole fractions. I'm just going to read off the answers here for uh, moles, and then I'll write down the answer for mole fraction. I did the calculation for uh, methanol, and I got 3.71 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of methanol. That's a Gen Chem 1 calculation. You should be able to do that. So volume to mass to moles. So use the density of the molar mass. Uh, ethanol, I got uh, a mole fraction of, and this is where I think I made a mistake last year. Well, actually, you could calculate the mole fraction. You would take 1 minus the mole fraction of uh, methanol. But I came up with a mole fraction of, I think it's 0.957 or something like that. Oops, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Uh, yeah, scratch that. I'm looking at mole fraction. Moles. I came up with 0 0.840 moles of, of ethanol. So your total number of moles, when you add those two together, is 0.877. Okay, fine. So the mole fractions I came up with were, and you can do the math here, knowing that I came up with a mole fraction of methanol, which is really small, of 0.0. Four, two, three, no units, and the mole fraction of uh, ethanol would be one minus that, or zero point. Again, double check my math. If I make a mistake, we'll correct it in class, as always. So that's math you should go back and do on your own. And then I came up with, uh, well, double check this. You solve this equation. Some question marks in my notes, of uh, 62 millimeters of mercury. Now, the thing is, does that answer make sense? Well, sure it does, because uh, the solution is mostly ethanol. Both components are volatile. So before, the vapor pressure went down, but here, how's the vapor pressure going to go down if both components or all components are volatile and turn into a gas? That doesn't make any sense. So here, they're both going to contribute to the vapor pressure, and it's all scaled to what the mole fraction is. The equation kind of makes sense. So the uh, vapor pressure of, of the total solution is 62. Again, double check that. The vapor pressure of pure ethanol is 59. That's because we're only adding a little bit of, of methanol to the mix. It's, it's not too terribly complicated of a concept. You just have to get the concentration calculations right. That's the main thing. Uh, I'm going to erase some of this because I don't know if I put another uh, slide there. So I'm going to switch over to osmotic pressure. And we are going to look at, well, let's see. Let's do glucose. That's that little schematic diagram I gave you was for was for glucose. And let me just get you started on the math. And I don't need to erase all of this right away. I should learn how to do this faster, but that's all right. So osmotic pressure, and you can rewrite this. So osmotic pressure has this symbol. It's a big capital pi. Uh, has there's basically two equations. Is uh, oh actually, this is a solution version of the ideal gas law. So instead of PV equals nRT, it's pi V equals nRT. But what I'm going to do to make this something that's easier for us to handle, you know that n is moles and V is volume, moles per volume. Well, that's molarity. So I'm going to bring volume over here and rewrite the equation so it's a little bit more straightforward. So the osmotic pressure given off by a solution where the solute is a non-volatile solute, like glucose, so it's not turning into a gas, it's just like sugar or salt or something dissolved in water, is, and we're just going to stick with um, covalent compounds here like glucose, simple stuff, is the molarity times R times T. Everything's pretty straightforward. This is the universal gas constant. This is molarity. And this is the Kelvin temperature. So let's do, so it's molarity, 
not molality, RT. So let's do solution number one. If you have to dig back into your notes to find the molarity of solution number one, go ahead and do that. Uh, I just need some time to erase this. And we're just going to put in the numbers. I'll just read them off while I'm erasing. The molarity was 0.3459 moles per liter. And the temperature is what? 25 degrees Celsius? That's easy. So the molarity was 0.3459. So the osmotic pressure is going to be no rearrangement necessary now. 0.3459. Uh, let's, let's make sure units cancel. Units on molarity are moles per liter. This is glucose. We don't really care about that right now. Uh, 0.08206. That would be given to you. Remember the units, liters, atmospheres, Kelvin, mole. And then, oops, sorry times 298 Kelvin. Yikes, that's 298. Okay, units, units, liters cancels, moles cancel, Kelvin cancels, and gives you units that it should. Pressure, atmospheres. Um, wow, this is a pretty, there's a lot of osmotic pressure here, isn't there? <laughs> this is a big effect. I came up with uh, three three sig figs, yeah, I think. Well, we can check that. I came up with an osmotic pressure; it's pretty high, of 8.46 atmospheres. Osmotic pressure is pretty good at pushing things across membranes. That's why it's important in your in your body and in natural systems. So that's osmotic pressure. Um, let me see if I did give myself another blank slide. I did. Good. Uh, yeah, last couple things. I'm just going to kind of mention them. If I, if I ever use these, I'll have to change the homework or give you more about this. So, so if I do anything with this, I'll just ask you to basically regurgitate this. So non-ideal solutions, something like sodium chloride, we already know this from even first semester, does this. And that's fine. We assume that these ions no longer interact with one another. They are separate. They are autonomous, hydrated, uh, or solvated, excuse me, solvated uh, cations and anions that do not interact with each other. So ideally, so in an ideal world, I, the Van Hoff factor equals two. At high concentration, The ions interact. There's so many of them. They actually, the plus minus will attract. They don't, they don't go back into a solid necessarily, but they just attract. This is called the ion pairing effect. Well, what is it? It's, well, it's the, it's the uh, solvated sodiums interacting with the solvated chlorine. They're just, they're, in, they're not forming a solid, they're just attracting each other. So they re-associate. Well, okay. And essentially, what, what does that mean? That's going to reduce your Van Hoff factor. Now, does that really change anything? No, well, yeah, it does. But I would have to give you the revised Van Hoff factor. So that's sometimes called... So, the I in actuality for something like a high concentration instead of two might be like 1.87, for example. And then you could use that Van Hoff factor to do additional calculations. That's really about all I want to say about um, non-ideal solutions. That basically just means non-ideal is uh, large concentrations where you start to see some of these some of these assumptions that you make are not really valid. And I think our last additional consideration, I hope I made a slide for this, is this one. And then I just have some interesting things to show you here at the end. Uh, gases. We have not talked anything about gases dissolving in, uh, well, 
water for the most part, but gas is dissolving in anything. So this is an interesting graph over here. Uh, solubility, well, there's a measure of how well things dissolve. And this is uh, 10 to the, this is molarity actually. It's uh, 10 to the minus third moles per liter. Okay. So what do you notice here? So pick something like uh, oxygen gas. I think you inherently know that when uh, a natural system and like a natural water system heats up, it loses oxygen. Well, or does it? Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. <laughs> so when you increase the temperature, the solubility goes down. Yes. So warm water does not hold the oxygen as well. So when, the, when water is colder, you have more dissolved oxygen. That's important for things like, uh, well, aqueous species, plants and animals that require on oxygen, just fish, for example, uh, to breathe. So the consequence is you talk about climate change and things like this that are warming the water. Well, you have less oxygen there. That has implications. You see the same general trend uh, for solubility of gases. So for gases, uh, Well, I'll do it in black. Solubility, I'm going to switch over to white, it's better, is inversely proportional. Remember, this means not equal, but proportional to temperature. That's almost the exact opposite of, or that is the exact opposite of solids. Usually, if you increase the temperature, you increase the solubility of a solid. Gases are the exact opposite. So, that's, that is just all I really want to say about that. Um, what else? Or I'm just checking my notes here. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that's, I, if I do anything more with solubility of gases, if I go through some specific electronic structures, uh, electron dot structures, I'll do that there. But just know now that gases dissolve better, well, when the temperature's colder. Why is that? Well, part of the reason is, is that it gives the water molecules an opportunity to uh, induce dipoles in things like methane and uh, oxygen. I guess I am going over that now. So if you look at uh, water, or, or excuse me, water, oxygen is nonpolar. Methane, I'm not doing the three-dimensional structure, methane is nonpolar. Why would it dissolve in water at all? Well, because water will induce a dipole in oxygen and in methane. And when the water's colder, there's less motion, it's able to induce the dipoles more effectively. And when you induce the dipoles more effectively, you increase the solubility. Therefore, that's the effect you see. So I may mention more of that in class. I think your book, I think I stole this from your book actually, this graph. So has that there as well. And finally, a couple things for general interest. I just thought it was kind of cool. Actually, the first one's not that cool. You can Google this one. If you Google, or whatever search engine you're using, Lake Nios in Cameroon, um, this is a venting pipe in this lake. There is a volcanic activity in and around this lake that produces carbon dioxide. You may have heard about this. Years ago, they had a volcanic eruption and this plume of carbon dioxide went into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is more dense than air, 80% oxygen, or excuse me, 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. And well, unfortunately, a lot of carbon dioxide settled down into some of the valleys surrounding Lake Nios and uh, some people suffocated because of it. It was a, a real tragedy. It wasn't that long ago that it happened, but now they, they had to install this venting pipe so that when a volcano does erupt again, it doesn't spew out carbon dioxide. It's kind of, it was kind of a shame because this, uh, this water is highly carbonated uh, because of the CO2. So not, not, not a, a very edifying, pleasant example. And just real quick, what do you think that is? One of the most valuable, flexible substances on the planet. That is crude oil. There's different kinds. But uh, looks like from the picture that I got, this is a, a, a drilling rig 
out at sea, so maybe something like the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And that's kind of what crude oil looks like. And why am I bringing this up? Because uh, how we purify crude oil is based on boiling point. And it's this, and again, you can Google this if you want to. This is just sort of for your information to give you an idea. So when you, when you distill, a distillation is something you'll do in organic chemistry is you, you boil a solution and then you collect the different fractions. So fractional distillation, that's not the same thing as hydraulic fracturing from uh, fracking for natural gas. And this just shows you, so things that have very low boiling points, in fact, things that are gases right away, come out the top and you get all kinds of stuff out of this. Uh, gasoline, kerosene, diesel, lubricating oils, fuel oil for your house, asphalt, all the junk that's left over doesn't even really boil. And this gives you a breakdown of what crude oil is used for. Uh, some of this stuff I think you probably already know. Da, 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 da. Yep, oh, this one, what does this mean? Petrochemical feedstocks. Uh, that actually means it's used to make other stuff, kind of like, like pharmaceuticals. Most of your medicines actually require crude oil as their basis, or more and more natural gas. But that was there just for, for interest and to show an application of boiling point applied to a very, very complex solution. And you'll see almost skyscraper size distillation columns in certain places uh, to collect all these different fractions that oil companies will do. And that's it, folks. Okay, that is the end of chapter 11. We will move on to our next topic with the next round. So.